My dear internet, hello, hello. Up next is my interview with Billy Basso, the creator of Animal Well. We first streamed this conversation at a recent conference just this month. Billy's game achieved mainstream success after getting published by Big Mode, the company of the famous YouTube reviewer Video Game Donkey. This was Big Mode's first published game, which is pretty special considering Billy made everything in Animal Well himself, including the game engine. And it turns out there's a big community out there for developers who like to create everything from scratch, or at least they want to understand how computers work on a deeper level. So that's what Handmade Network is all about, an online community for these kinds of folks like Billy. And then there's Handmade Cities, where we host conferences, meetups, and co-working sessions around the world. And I'm grateful to be the founder of both. Billy was inspired by the handmade movement, and we got into that discussion. Then we just talk shop the entire time, <laughs> assuming you, like us, love creating software from the ground up. And yeah, Billy's a talented, humble guy who loves his craft. So it was a pleasure to pick his brain. I don't upload much to YouTube, by the way, but if you like this, let me know and I'll post stuff more often. And now here's Billy Basso, creator of Animal Well. Hello, Internet, and welcome to another Handmade Boston. This is the second Handmade Boston we've ever done. As you know, the Handmade conferences have always been in Seattle. And just last year, for the first time, we're trying to expand our presence a little bit, you know, grow this indie movement a little bit. And so Handmade Boston is, we call it like the sister conference to, to Seattle because it's smaller, it's more intimate, and we're trying to go back to the OG spirit of just like talking to somebody that we that we admire who's done interesting work and get to know what they're up to a little bit and like what their thought process is to build uh this kind of software that we that we love right so today we are joined by none other than billy basso the creator of animal well hello billy what's up hello happy to be here <laughs> you're alive yes i'm alive and uh feeling feeling all right feeling pretty good that's awesome. Congratulations on the work that you've done this year and especially a year that is not easy, you know, for, for many people, you know, there's uh, folks who are, uh, have been affected by uh, layoffs or folks who just mm -hmm. like have too many personal life situations. It feels like almost everyone I talk to has a situation going on, right? It's, it's just, yeah, it's just one of those years. And uh, so it's fun to hear that, you know, there are still some, um, definitely some success stories going on that we got inspired by and, uh, so good work with that. And let's start actually with uh, how we how we even met you and I in the first place. How about we surprise the audience with that? Sure. Yeah. So um, I'll just start. I've been uh, following Handmade Hero and and sort of the Handmade Network stuff since the very beginning um, when when Casey started started streaming, making his game engine and game 
uh, from scratch. So that was, yeah, I think you told me back in like 2014. I remember actually watching it while I was at work. Um, I was at Phosphor Games at the time and uh, just like, I remember kind of some people at the office being like, like almost like joking about it, be like, oh, well, why doesn't he make the computer himself too? Or why, why doesn't he be like, you know, why don't you build the universe? Uh, just like kind of extrapolating the the sort of the philosophy um, to a comical extent. But then, um, yeah, I um, have just been sort of aware of what's been going on and followed along a lot. And it's been, you know, very inspiring, like useful resource for me um, for a large part of my career. And um, yeah, we actually met in 2019. I went to Handmade Seattle that year um, just because I was a fan. And uh, I think we chatted for a little bit and probably just w blended in with the crowd. But I was er in the first couple of years of working on Animal Well, and it was still like kind of in its early infancy. Um, and I was just there kind of checking out all the, the cool cool stuff people were working on. And that was a core memory unlock when we talked uh, recently. It's like, yes, I remember. And I even went to the ticket sales records. I'm like, there's Billy. It's like, <laughs> that's cool. And I, I do remember a little bit of that. And that, yeah. that's awesome. And in some ways, it shows the progression between us a little bit because that first Handmade Seattle was like a very scrappy, tiny conference just, you know, starting out. And now I can do it full time. And then you kind of like in parallel are writing, making this video game. It was early on. Did you even know how far you were, you were going to get with it or? Um, I think I, it, it was still like, yeah, curly, kind of early on. And it was a thing I just like was kind of working on, on my laptop. And I, I remember sitting and waiting for like the Mike Acton talk that year in the room. And I was, I was actually programming animal well, and just kind of just. <laughs> I forget what I was working on, um, but it was just this thing that it's like I kept kept in my bag and was just kind of doing on the side for fun. Um, and yeah, I, I was actually I think I wanted to show it at Handmade Con um, maybe the following year, and that's what I was asking you about because I was like, I think people would appreciate this. But but then I kind of got very busy and development kind of exploded in complexity. Yes. Uh, Yes, I can't imagine. And we'll, we'll get into the day. And COVID happened. I forgot about oh, COVID. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a huge pivot, too, for because I, I was all in person. Then COVID happened. I'm like, should I run the conferences only online? How does that work? And uh, in some ways, that helped because after the COVID, I just decided to do like this hybrid live streamed physical online track kind of like conference. And that, that's what exploded for me to be able to be full time with it. And uh, but today, we're not really talking about me here. I want the audience to be inspired by what you've done with with animal war i just i just thought it was interesting that we've 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 talked for uh we talked many years ago already and it's awesome that we finally get this chance to discuss some more so uh what what led you to let's just dive straight into so i'm, I'm assuming the audience has played animal well if you haven't checked out animal well please do it is on steam and do we have any other platforms um yes it's on switch and playstation 5 as well there you go guys so check it out in terms of the game but today we're talking about the the, the development of it, the, the programming aspect of it, the audience here. Many of us are uh, programmers in our own right. And we're, we're kind of curious in, in this question that we get asked all the time, although not as much anymore because people are seeing the value of reinventing the wheel a little bit finally. Mm -hmm. Like the industry is finally seeing value in reinventing the wheel again. But it's still a question that comes up, you know, like why reinvent the wheel? And uh, I am curious, I'm excited to ask you, like what led you to take ownership over, over your tech stack? And honestly, what does that mean? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you might have somebody making a web app where they said, oh, I'm handmade or like, I, I, I'm low level. And what that means for them is that they're not going to use the huge giant JavaScript framework, right? They'll just mm -hmm. use, yeah. <laughs> you know, vanilla JavaScript, vanilla CSS and things like that, which is great. Right. But they're still on top of some big platform like the browser. Right. So that's what handmade means to them. So what would handmade mean to you? What does it mean for you to do everything from scratch, so to speak? And we talked earlier about like, you're not, you're not writing your own risk five ISA, you know, mm -hmm. CPU, right. CPU, yeah. right? Like, so where are you in that kind of like abstraction barrier and, and then why, like, why did you decide to take the plunge? Yeah. So just as an overview, um, Animal Wells, uh, it's written in like kind of 
with a custom engine that was sort of developed alongside the game. And it's it's a C++ based um, with almost no additional libraries. I use um, the STB libraries for um, load, loading uh, Vorbis files and PNGs. But other than that, it's just using on Windows, just the Win32 Win like basic stuff. Um, it's not even using like uh, Glut or, um, mm. or um, anything like any sort of Windows framework. Um, but uh, yeah, so it just the the way it came about was just I don't know, kind of kind of natural. Um, when I was in college, I took a couple um, game engine classes. Um, actually, we had a, a teacher named Ed Keenan who used to be the tech director at Midway um, back in like the like late '90s, early 2000s, um, and uh, yeah, I just kind of learned a lot about just sort of the basics of what go into a game engine. Um, it was just part of my like sort of core curriculum, um, but I found it really fun. And um, I think a big part of the draw to like software and video games to me is just just knowing how they work. That's kind of at the core of what's intrigued me about them. They seem, you know, like really kind of magical, like seeing seeing these moving images on, on screen and stuff like I think uh, as a kid, you just you just don't know any idea how it works, and it it is just incredibly complicated. So like, um, it it's amazing that we have all all this software and technology, and and so many people just take it for granted about how it does all the stuff it does. So um, I think yeah, that's just part of programming. Is I like I want to know I want to get those answers to like how how does this thing I've wondered about my whole life do do its trick like um and it's just a mountain of questions and answers like that um so in a way like using higher level frameworks or um or game engines is kind of like it's it's sidestepping the fun part to me where it's like it's it's like brushing it on the rug and you know it's thinking like don't don't worry about how this does the thing it does. You just want to design your game in, in La La Land and <laughs> just uh, for the imaginary system. And um, don't worry, you can just, just come up with the ideas and use this interface we made up for you and and uh, oh, work yeah. that way. So that just feels like, I don't know, kind of a little hollow to me. Um, and I had a lot of experience using like Unreal and Unity at um, you know software jobs I've had. So. I think in a way that was still helpful to learn, to see examples of how these like large scale systems are put together and to be able to use Unreal Engine like three and four and have access to the source code and on a daily basis, be able to kind of like peek into there and, you know, uh, step around and just see, observe how that's all put together and get ideas. Um, but, but yeah, ever since I like had those classes in college, I was always kind of on the side trying to make a game engine just as almost like a learning exercise and um, continue just trying to make things myself. Um, and I actually spent about about two, maybe two or three years just making a general purpose uh, like 3D game engine um, oh, wow. while, as a side hobby. And um, it kind of, it was like one of my first like large scale software projects that I, you know, made on my own. And this was before Handmade Hero, um, where I started on this before I had even encountered that. And so it's like your typical, like, I think, junior programmer, like learning all the uh, the mistakes <laughs> that you would expect. Um, um, just kind of just learning as I went. Even then, but it was still like an OpenGL engine. Um, but I was using all the, it was object oriented. I had like this big object hierarchy with all this all these classes and I was using smart pointers everywhere. Um, and just like kind of all these, uh, um, and modern like not C++ really isms. Yeah. I was, yes. All the modern C plus plus isms that you kind of just like stumble into, um, using as you're just trying to kind of come to terms with learning how, how to be a C plus plus programmer. And there's so much, you know, I, I was reading, let me see the books. I think I have it right here. Like effective C++ and modern C++, all those, 
all those books where you're just like you're just learning the language and you're like trying to advance your skills so you get a lot of um sort of opinions like kind of unknowingly while you're while you're doing that um and so so yeah that that project is kind of ballooned and ballooned and ballooned and um and i didn't have like a, a critical sort of pitfall to it um in terms of it actually like shipping into anything is i didn't have like a, a clear game idea in mind when i started working on it it was more just like um maybe i was thinking like oh i'll eventually i'll have enough tools here that it'll be like really easy to just make a game and uh i'll come up with the idea later but in the meantime i'm just gonna build an editor and all these libraries and utility functions for like hypothetical things um and to be fair it was mostly i guess just a learning exercise it was just an area to have fun but um yeah it was after i really started watching handmade hero and i kind of you know those first so many episodes where i saw how like casey set up his like gameplay code in a dll and uh just got just was using just the basic windows like sort of message pump to you know just set things up and i was like okay wow i've been, <laughs> I've been doing so many things wrong um you saw the very bare but, bones yeah to get something up and running and that was shocking to you yeah and um yeah it just made me uh it was kind of like a little bit of a wake-up call so i continued i think working on my current engine at the time for maybe a three or six more months just like maybe you know adapting a little bit of that ethos um but then eventually i was just like okay i need to let me let me just start from scratch here i want to i want to mm. clean slate um and i want to just just like forget the idea of making a game engine and um just like try to pare back the the scope of this as much as possible so um and and i want to make something with the goal of of finishing it and shipping it and my my new ideology is just being um very pragmatic in the terms of like what i implement and only write code to solve a very specific problem like when it arises so just start with don't make any assumptions about what a game engine is or what is needed to ship just like i'll mm -hmm. my my strategy was just like i will deal with it when it becomes a real problem until then i will not do it so even like silly wow. things like I didn't even write myself like a, a vector two class for this like 2d game engine i was just like still doing like uh just like loose float variables for like the x and y position because it's like i don't know if i need that yet let me just see how far i could go and then eventually did, did you wrap like, it oh, in a this... struct at least or not even <laughs> no not even uh um but then eventually like very that was early on it's like okay this this is this is a right thing you need you need to make a vector struct Ooh, That's... so you learned some heuristics as it became painful certain things became a little painful and you're like oh okay i see that this part uh makes sense to this me. part is right yeah it was in, in a way i was trying to validate everything i thought i knew um with like uh a practical use case so i didn't write anything preemptively um if i'm working on like a i started i'm early on in like my next project now and i've learned so much from shipping animal well that now i do have a lot of sort of expertise and knowledge about what things are necessary to ship so i can like um i i've like learned some things that i can preemptively implement that i know i'll need and that'll save me some time but back then it was more like i've never shipped a complete game myself um i've worked on larger teams and i've worked with these like larger engines and they have you know hundreds of features and um and you can't just start by implementing those hundreds of features because you don't it's it's unfeasible for one person to do so you have to really kind of just trace the outline of your requirements very <laughs> very uh closely um to to minimize the amount of work that you actually need to do to get the thing that you want done um so anyways that was sort of my yeah my rule that i sort of made for myself and uh i kind of just followed it 
all the way to the end. It still took seven years to, to finish the game, but every step along the way, I was, um, it wasn't until I did something, you know, three or four times and it was becoming obvious that like, um, there's some redundancy here. And like the, I waited a good healthy amount of time for the like abstraction to emerge in whatever the system I was making in. And then I would, um, and you waited a lot longer than most people think you would want to wait. It, it just sounds like mm -hmm. you really let it go on until you actually felt this almost certainty that, okay, yes, this can be abstracted in this and that way, because, you know, but, but that's a lot of waiting time that people are not used to. And, mm -hmm. but now you said though, for your next project, I'm curious, you, you sounds like you're going to make some educated guesses of, uh, abstractions that you think are going to be useful right away. But I'm wondering, that doesn't mean you're going to put yourself in a straight jacket with those mm -hmm. uh, scaffoldings, let's say, like, do you have a strategy to just say, okay, I was wrong about this educated guess. How, how straightforward or trivial is it going to be to like break down the scaffolding and build a new one? Like, yeah. Have you thought of that a little bit or? Yeah. So like, um, there's a few easy examples that are like kind of no brainers, like, uh, when I first started the project, I, I think just the scope in my mind was different. I wasn't planning on doing um, localization, for example, and I wasn't planning on doing any ports. So um, when I was starting the project, I'm like, this is just Windows. I'm going to embrace all the Windows-ness of this, and <laughs> um, and I'm just going to use, uh, I'm not going to use um, wide characters or UTF-8 or anything. I'm just going to use uh, C strings everywhere a single byte characters and assume that. So later on, I was like, okay, we're, we're going to have to get this localized and, you know, Japanese and Chinese characters or whatever take up multiple bytes. So that was like a, a thing I had to go back and kind of go scrub through the whole code base and kind of add support for that. So that's like a mistake where I'm, I'm like, okay, now I know <laughs> I'll never do that again. Uh, if I'm going to release a game and put many years of work into it, it's going to be localized. So just, I know that from the beginning. Um, and then in terms of like, uh, porting like platform yeah. abstraction, I think I want to work even harder to minimize the amount of like platform specific code. And, uh, I think just out of habit before I kind of would put more functionality into like the renderer or, um, the audio system or any of these, like, um, when I was like wrapping direct X or X input or, or X audio, um, it, it got a little tempting to be like, well, I'll make this, like, I'll wrap this API, but then I'll add some extra stuff to it. Like kind of make it how I wish it were. Um, like, like I will just kind of hide the fact that there are blend states or something in mm. direct X and, uh, I'll just like set one up by default inside the initialization code for the renderer. But then when I port it to Switch or PlayStation, now I have this code in there that it's like I'm setting up this sort of like game specific data. Um, and it would have actually been less code if I sort of just kind of followed the, the API I was wrapping more closely and then like let the game set that data up and then it could create multiple blend blend states. Um, and, and so that was like another thing I sort of changed mid development and it was like, okay, well, I, let me just keep anything that's like, uh, that's sort of specific to this game, like in the game code and like my, like engine, which is more just like, like the platform layer that, um, sort of abstracts what the platform is just like really be more strict about that. Like, and, and try to keep that as small as possible. So then when I do have to port to another platform, there's just less code to write. Um, so you want to just like, you want the porting process to have like require as little code as possible to, to happen. Um, it also so. sounds like your engine, uh, it's not like you said it exa exactly, but I got the sense that you stopped thinking about your engine as an engine almost because yes. Yeah. And I wonder if like, if that shift in thinking really unlocked productivity in ways that maybe it didn't, because, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm curious about your thoughts because very often I, 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 if I play devil's advocate for those who tell us to use mm -hmm. an engine, the pre-made <laughs> in order to ship, uh, 
to ship software, ship a game, whatever it is, uh, have like this pre-made framework. It's because, hey, like there's dozens of people who are smarter than you many years ago who have uh, iterated over this framework or over this engine many times and it's feature parity in all the ways that modern gamers expect, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so when you feel that you have to make, you want to make your own engine because, you know, you value the ability to uh, understand everything as a programmer. You, you love the experience of, of knowing what's going on at all times. And that's just a value that you have as a programmer is that you, you love the understanding of everything. And I'm sure that helps also with like innovation. And I'm, I, I, I know it's a tired cliche, but truly, if you want to innovate on a project, the more you know about the thing you're driving to make the project, obviously like mm -hmm. the more innovation you can do because like there's no black boxes, right? Uh, uh, but it feels scary that people are telling you like, look at all these engines and all this stuff that they have. And now you feel that you have to prove yourself with mm -hmm. the engine that you write from scratch that matches almost all of these features. Or if they don't match it, you have you feel like you have to excuse yourself somehow, like be apologize and like this and that, right? So it almost sounds like yeah. for you to drop the whole, this is an engine, oh, sorry, this is not, to, for you to say this is not an engine, it's almost like you cast away all of those debates and arguments and concerns and anxiety. Am I, am I correct in that assessment or? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a perfect observation because in the previous project I was talking about, I was making that general purpose, like 3D engine. I had the mindset that, yeah, I'm making an engine and I would say this is my game engine and there was no game. It was just purely an engine. Um, but then my idea, the, the shift in perspective I had with animals development was like, I'm making this game without an engine. Like I'm just making the game. The goal is to make the game in the later on you can point to parts of the code base and be like oh that's the engine that like kind of formed under under the surface as i was solving problems um that i'll and then you know in future projects i'll be able to like pluck out certain parts and be like okay this solved this problem you know nicely in a generic way um but i don't want to like assume it's 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 actually counterproductive to like i think make make that um like an, an, an engine's a uh it's an a it's a mental model that we have it's not a real thing you know like there's a lot of i think that's a big part of like you know data oriented programming and and like kind of we, we talk about that a lot but like a game engine's all it's it's like object oriented programming where it's like the engine's not real there's not <laughs> a single thing you could point to but like the um the platform SDKs you're using, those are real. Um, the development kits are real. Like uh, the, the, you know, the hardware, the processor and stuff, that's all real. So it's it's more just like trying to write code for the game. And then when those parts are different, when you're targeting either like an ARM architecture or, you know, x86 architecture, it's like, okay, at this point, the, the, the solution is different if I'm writing like intrinsics or something. So it's like here I'll have a pound to find depending on what platform I'm on. And that's a real thing that needs to happen. I didn't make that up. It's something I kind of encountered while I was working. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that helped a lot. And then in the parts where I did kind of, you know, not follow that, that idea like close enough, it did, I kind of regretted it um, by, by putting any extra code in mixed in with like the, the renderer or stuff. Um, uh, it just made porting harder because I just had extra stuff in there that needed to be duplicated or, or pulled out at, later on. Um, so yeah, that, that for sure, like, um, was the right call. Oh my God. I'm curious. Once again, I'm trying to make explicit certain things that I'm, I think you're saying secretly <laughs> for your next <laughs> project. It almost sounds like you're not going to be reusing the entirety of the existing well engine not engine of of animal well wow. yeah whoa t t tell me more yeah so um yeah i the way i've been thinking about it because i've been working on it for the past past few months and it's still very very early so don't don't assume i'll, I'll have a new game coming out soon or anything what's but, the title let's uh, reveal it for the first time at <laughs> boston i'm kidding no, go, go for it go for it continue yeah. <laughs> um but yeah it feels like uh it's like when you move and um, you kind of use it as an opportunity to like pack up all your stuff and then maybe throw away a lot of things um, that maybe weren't that 
that you don't <laughs> that you don't need anymore and um you've been kind of putting off a lot of like reorganizations and stuff so um i'm viewing this as like i'm setting up a new clean project but i'm i'm harvesting a lot of code from from animal well and uh but like while i'm doing that i'm kind of maybe sometimes just keeping it mostly exactly the same but a lot of times it's kind of cleaning up the api um doing give doing almost a postmortem on for myself of like did i use this the way i would originally intended to or it's like how did i end up actually using this api in the game over the years um and i have i have these like real world examples of like how it ended up working and so um i'm kind of able to sort of uh do like a version 2.0 um, or these like API breaking changes uh, to things now as I set it up. Um, so it's actually a pretty pretty fun process. It's like it's like I'm getting the uh, the satisfaction of like building an engine from scratch, um, but but it's going a lot faster because I just have a bunch of pre written code that I can kind of draw from and uh, I can kind of like piece it together. I'm, much I'm imagining you in a garden that's the animal world garden and you're just walking around mm -hmm. and harvesting like you said picking up oh i like this plant for the new garden and i like this little mm -hmm. uh soil manure that i use i'm gonna use it for the new garden right but other yeah. stuff just stays in place it's like okay this was nice for this garden but it's not going to be useful for the other one <laughs> that's mm -hmm. uh, can, can we discuss a little bit of the, the harvesting that you've done so far because i'm curious i'm assuming you have some kind of let me not asset streaming but you you gotta have a way to import the uh, art assets and audio assets and anything that is like basically static static binary data that's not code mm -hmm. and that needs to be imported in a project in, a, in the project in a kind of like cpu friendly way whatever that means and yeah like those things don't change too much across projects unless you're really making a, again you don't have to reveal anything because like if the game is like so alien to the current one like we're talking we're talking uh 3d and like vr innovation whatever it might be right mm -hmm. like yeah. maybe the asset uh, streaming or asset import import does have to change a bit, but otherwise, in general, like I would imagine, you would want you would want to harvest certain classical things, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, like I said, uh, importing assets, maybe audio streaming, and yeah, I, I'm not sure what else. So, can you tell us a little bit of the things that you think are like, yeah, this is easy to harvest. It's just trivial to pick and pluck. Yeah, so that that is actually something that kind of got brought over and and also kind of enhanced. Um, so the way assets work in in Animal Well, uh, it was it was pretty important when I was during development that I would be able to iterate on on the assets. So um, in a debug build, they're all like in a in an asset folder, um, and I actually have two. I have like just an asset folder, and then I have a generated assets folder that's sort of um, platform and build configuration specific, and uh, and so. Um, some things go there, like compiled shaders or converted audio formats. Like I'll keep all my audio in uh, wave wave files. That um, that's kind of like the source of truth. Uh, and then, as part of a build step, those wave files will get encoded into Org Vorbis files. Um, or if it was there was a better you know file format, depending on the platform that was maybe more natively supported. In theory, they could be encoded into a different format. Um, and so those go in like this generated sort of assets folder. Uh, and then I have sort of a system that sort of monitors for um, mod for file modifications. Um, and it will like reload um, any of those assets in those folders like at runtime. Um, and then there's like kind of a sort of a callback area in the game that will know how to, depending on the file type, know how to like reload. Um, whether it's a shader or a texture or an audio file or, or a font. Um, and then so I can edit all those assets like while the game is running and they'll get refreshed sort of um, live. So so getting that working was like very important to development. Um, and, and then in the uh, release builds, all those assets are statically um, sort of compiled to just see uh, byte arrays um, that are then uh, just like compiled into the game. So there's no loading. I wanted to eliminate any like failure cases with the file system or 
or error checking that I needed to do. So I'm like 100% certain that when the game is running, every asset uh, is just immediately accessible um, and is likely in a format that it can just be used like directly. Um, so, so yeah, I was very happy with how that turned out. And that was sort of a system that kind of um, went through a few iterations during Animal Wall's development, but within the first few years kind of took that shape. And, um, but now there was a few things that weren't amazing. Like I, it wasn't easy to add new assets, for example, like while, while the game was running, um, cause they also, it was doing some code generation where it would like create an enum of all the assets with like, uh, integer IDs. Um, so none of them were like referenced by string or anything. Um, and sometimes like, uh, it was hard to like add to that without um, sort of screwing things up. So if I wanted to create a new asset, something I would need to like, I would need to shut the game down, put it in there and then like <laughs> reload it. But so I've kind of uh, improved things with the new project to, I can add things more seamlessly. Um, but yeah, and then there's like a general entity system that I have oh, wow. uh, that um, also kind of, it ended up being a little weirder than than I've seen in other games. Um, there's no like, there's really no shared data between them, not even like a position or flags or anything. Um, Interesting. But, uh, and they were all, at first I was just kind of doing it the, the dumbest way possible where I, let's say there was like a, an entity type would be like, uh, fern there was like a little fern bush and i'd have like an array of ferns um <laughs> and i'd count like how many ferns there were on each screen and then just straight up love it just straight up and then when i would like load the screen i would just iterate over all the tiles um you know from top to bottom and i would check like is this tile a fern tile like <laughs> based on like every every tile had like an uh an integer id as well and if it were then like um add out fern struct to this array uh and it was just like the dumbest way i thought to be able to do it that also maybe still seemed like um okay all the ferns are together so mm -hmm. maybe there's going to be some good like cache coherency <laughs> here uh mm -hmm. there's no dynamic memory allocation um mm -hmm. uh we're dealing with all the fern stuff at the same time so maybe like they're you know utilizing the instruction cache better than than if it were just like a big uh, parent sibling like child yep. object hierarchy like scattered all throughout memory or something. Um, so then, yeah, the, in the beginning I was like, okay, anytime I make a new entity type, it involves creating a new array like in some sort of global structure or this there's like a screen. Each screen was like sort of had some memory um, that was like defined by a struct, and then. So it's just, and then say there's like ghost or something, that's a new entity type. And if you find a ghost tile, add a ghost to the ghost array. And then in the update loop, loop through all the ferns, update them, loop through all the ghosts, update them. In the draw loop, loop through all the ferns, draw them, loop through all the it's incredible. ghosts, draw them. So uh, I was like, I don't know, the, 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 we'll, we'll, if this gets annoying, I'll I'll deal with it again. <laughs> but this seems like how the code should be. Um, or this is like the problem. This is, this is the work that needs to happen. Um, yep. so I ended up, uh, kind of, um, figuring out some tricks where you can use the, uh, C preprocessor to sort of define a macro, um, for, you know, you know, to substitute some code in, into somewhere. So I ended up creating a, a header file that had a list of all the entity types. And um, I had a macro that was like define entity. And then um, the solution was then add one line of code to this entity list, which was just a C header file. Um, it would be like define entity, you know, open, open parentheses, like fern, close parentheses. Um, and then in the various spots in code where I needed to do something related to the, all the entity types, um, I would, uh, I would redefine the like define entity macro um, to mean something different. So if I'm about to update them all, I'd be like, 
define entity macro now means update like you know pound sign pound sign this entity type uh and then um include that header file in in that point at that point in code and then like undefine it so it's like a, a trick i've seen other people use um and then when i want to draw redefine it to mean draw and then include the header file there as well um and then undefine it afterwards so i have this one i i like solve the problem of um not repeating myself i right. guess <laughs> in code uh but it was kind of like a poor man's like code generation where it was uh yeah. just inserting all the but it was a time saving necessary. trick that yielded benefit right because you were now you're more productive and iterating on the work so yeah yeah and it ended up working out and i like look at it and i'm like okay this is pretty different than i've seen in any other game engine but it like solves my problem perfectly um it's like efficient like performance wise and uh it it's pretty easy to set up um yeah. and it just involves adding a new one new like source file for each entity type i want to create and then there's some kind of, of a common interface i put interface in quotes because it's not like a a true like virtual pointer kind of interface but just this sort of these set of a set of functions that the linker is going to try to link to based on the That's, macros uh would you say would you say account. there's would you say there's how much meta programming was involved in the making of this game so you know we just talked what well, we just talked about this poor man's macro time saving trick it's it's meta programming mm -hmm. um do we yeah. do we have other forms of meta programming that you felt compelled to use um not a ton there's a little bit um i would I abuse this like macro trick a lot and I used it for shaders and I used it for audio files. It, I kind of, and, and I think sprites maybe. And so there's a lot of macro kind of substitution stuff throughout the code. And, um, you know, people get kind of scared of macros, or at least I remember when I was in college and I'd be like, <laughs> we learned how to use them. And it's like, be careful with these. You should probably use a template instead. Cause that's like type safe and, um, <laughs> it you know it like will protect you you can really you know they'd have all these contrived examples how like I mean, if you put this statement in the parentheses and then uh it the code that like kind of gets generated like is you know subtly wrong and um but in in practice like once you get them set up i had almost no bugs related to them at all so uh i think yeah. the and there's there's not a lot of indirection overhead let's say like i would imagine if a programmer yeah. Uh, comes in and looks at your code base and like sees your macro trick, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Like I probably would have done mm -hmm. the same thing. It's, it's that kind of macro work, right? It's not, yeah, it's not convoluted. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's, 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 it's doing kind of only what it needs to. Um, I'm not trying to solve for overly generalized cases. Um, yeah, I've seen some, some macro things, <laughs> you know, in the past that are like, it's like, Okay, well, you, you, seven you, levels deep of like nesting um and just like you have to be like a detective to trace back yes to it, yes i look at those people i look at those people i'm like you're the reason c programmers get such a bad rap like what are you doing yes yes, yes. <laughs> yeah um, or even like if you look at like the standard template library or or even just some of the windows libraries and you're like it's just macros upon macros of like type def i've seen those that you have to to figure out what the actual type is of of some of those things that you got to trace like it's like seven type defs back <laughs> to like no no no, um, no 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 okay before the ptsd comes in let's discuss yeah the uh okay i'm glad that you also mentioned that in the harvesting of your animal mm -hmm. well cold garden there mm -hmm. might be some things you harvest as is or almost as is and then there might be others that you're like okay i like this but it's gonna have to change a little bit so you you move it over and then you enhance it like you said so that's that's pretty interesting how about memory management that's an interesting question hmm. because uh sure. the this is a hot topic in the past few years you know in the systems programming community let's say everybody who uses a systems language like c plus plus uh c mm -hmm. rust uh zig odin etc uh, Nim, I suppose, and you have all of these languages and Ajay as well. So, mm -hmm. a, a big question like there's just there's like a rift. There's a rift in the community, let's say, and I'm not sure what the ratio is, but certainly uh, there's a strong contingent saying like you know memory safety is king, 
and mm -hmm. you know we so why aren't you why aren't, why aren't you making your games uh, or applications or, or general software memory safe? And obviously, we have to consider that systems languages are used for more applications than we know. Like, it's just a lot, right? You have space mm -hmm. exploration, you have video games, you have desktop apps, you have uh, literal phone apps, everything, right? So we have to be careful not to be too generic about, uh, you know, the, the value of memory safety and what you mean by that. So I don't want to get too mm -hmm. generic. So let's, let's, but let's narrow it down to just games and specifically indie games, indie games for one person. <laughs> what, what, what would you, what, what are your thoughts on the idea of memory safety? Because you show the language that some people would call, you know, like you're going to have issues with memory management. So did you have yeah. issues with memory management and, um, um, and, and how did you, and whatever issues you might've had, how did you address them? Yeah. Um, to be honest, no, uh, I didn't really have issues with memory management, but, but it did fall into the category of things where it's like, there's a lot of conflicting opinions about how important memory management is and like how you should deal with it and how you should prioritize it. So this was another thing I was like, I'm going to just see, I'm going to like, if I, the, uh, another goal was just like, I want to kind of validate all these assumptions people have and if i end up like kind of shooting myself in the foot in the process like that's fine so be it because i'll i'll learn and i'll i'll deeply intuitively learn the value of why people say you should do it this way and then i'll be like i i understand now but um so yeah i i from the early on i wanted to like kind of minimize just dynamic memory allocation as much as possible because i mean that's just there's no argument that that's bad for performance and you know making like a kernel call to in malloc is is slow um very slow compared to most most things mm -hmm. um so so a lot of the code is just um or a lot of the data is just defined in in structs or nested structs and uh i i think i literally have just one like global state struct um that's for the game and then everything on screen is in another struct that's like the screen state and it lives or man then maybe there's like the game state which is everything during like one play session of the game and that lives in the global struct and then the screen state is all the things that are like active in memory when you're on one particular screen in the game and that lives in the game state and then there's all the entities that are each a struct and they live in the screen state. So it's like this pretty clear, like, I don't know, nested hierarchy of yeah. memory. Um, and the, well, I guess I do some like kind of clever things at certain points, but um, I'm never sort of asking the operating system for memory. I do allocate it all on, on startup and um, I just, there's just some hard coded limit that I kind of figured out while I was developing the game of um, how much I needed. And then I just get that big block of memory. Um, I think I just called malloc once and then the sort of engine executable holds on to that memory. And then when I call, when I ask the game to like update itself or draw itself, um, I sort of give it a pointer to its big memory block. And then it's sort of, um, and that happens every frame and then it sort of just holds on to it. Um, and then if the DLL reloads, the memory is still like intact. Um, and then the new DLL is just kind of get, we just give it back its pointer to its all its memory. Oh. Um, so that was, that was a cool trick and being able to just in general, hot reload, um, the code is, I think the single most important feature, um, you could ever right for yourself if you're making a project mm -hmm. in this way because it just alleviates the need to make so many tools um and and little editors for yourself because if you could just you have like the text editor and you could just like reliably change values like while the game is running that it's just like so that one thing is so powerful and uh it just like um just removes the need to make so many other things mm -hmm. you would potentially need. Um, but that's just an, an aside. I highly recommend <laughs> that you prioritize that because uh, that paid back more than like, I think anything I did. Um, arenas? I but yeah, so, any, any arenas? Yes. So, um, and I'm actually trying to do more sort of arena allocation 
in this new project um, just because I found, um, so with, on one hand, statically allocating everything is good when you know how many you'll need. In a lot of cases, I would just have a fixed size array where say there's like particle effects. I'd be like, okay, at most there can be, I don't know, 32 particle effects at once going on. And if it like, uh, if I need more than that, it's like a ring buffer. It'll just start like yeah. stomping over itself. Um, and that's fine. Um, but, um, but also by, by needing to like globally, um, sort of define the entire layout of the game in memory, uh, it does cause a few complications with like, um, header dependencies because, um, for a thing to like have something nested into it, it needs to know the the declaration of it. So like you need to kind of include the header. If the global state needs to know about the game state, which is inside of it, it needs to like have the definition of the game state. And maybe that's what you still want, but yeah, um, I agree. But by having like arena allocators, like you can just, and having those defined for the various sort of points, like sort of life cycles in the game, like say you have like one arena for just like, this is when the game starts up. And if something just needs to be sort of statically allocated and just exists once, you can have an arena for that. Here's an arena for just like the life cycle of one game session. So mm. it'll get cleared if you go back to the main menu. Um, and so when the game starts, it can allocate from that. Um, if you have a, a screen in the game that you walk onto, you can have an arena just for that. And then anytime you switch screens, it gets cleared. And then you can have one like per frame. Um, so every frame, it just gets cleared. So um, I think it's like a really nice and kind of intuitive way to think about memory management. Um, and when you ask yourself like, what arena should this go in? And the answer is pretty like obvious. Um, so I'm trying to do more of that because then you can then ask, you can make like a, a function where you pass it in an arena to like allocate something and it'll just like push it onto it. And it doesn't, the calling code doesn't need to know the size of the thing that's going to get allocated. So it, it kind of helps, I think, decouple um, sort of a lot of uh, the header dependencies Although that can slow files down. I want to say it's interesting and noteworthy that you didn't have to go too deep into arenas for your first game. And yes. you're only now seeing it more useful as you want to decouple things because you're going to have multiple maybe projects going in. And maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> again, the harp, I love that verb, harvesting, uh, becomes just more straightforward with arenas because then your function signatures take in the arena, but they don't have to take in kind of like hard-coded, well-known sizes, part of some mm -hmm. global state yeah. on one particular game, right? Yeah, exactly. But um, But I think so... Yeah, it wasn't super necessary. I did have like, you know, some maybe more header dependency um, than I than I would have maybe liked, but but I still, because I was only writing the code I needed to, and I was pro programming in a very like, you know, plain old data style struct C style, um, the compile times were still pretty fast and I could reload the DLL, like recompile it within, I think like two seconds or something. So it was still like, a pretty good workflow. Um, so it never got to the crazy point where you can have like, like I remember trying to recompile, just re, just do an incremental rebuild for like Unreal Engine 4 was like, I don't even know how long. It was just like, you you spin around in your chair, like, <laughs> like and like look at the ceiling, like while it while it happens. Uh, it's just, it's, it's definitely long enough to like totally break your train of thought. Um, Billy, Billy, your approach to, you, you, you init your, you dynamically initialize the memory you want once at an it time, mm -hmm. and and that's it. By the way, this is a NASA approved approach. <laughs> so good. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, for those in the audience who have never heard of me, you know, I started my career in a very lucky way with working for Kennedy Space Center. That's at Florida. That's NASA. And oh my God, like there are rules for programming because they, they use C a lot for sure, but then let's see. And it's mm -hmm. like, yep, yeah, only only malloc once. Okay, that's it, no more <laughs> at, at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, and other strict rules that you may or may not have to follow for a video game, obviously, but it's like, yep, yeah, no more than one pointer per function signature. And that just solves 
uh, pointer aliasing in, 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 in many straightforward ways. You don't need to have. Uh, we don't. We don't want recursion either, so you cannot do recursion. And some other, yeah. some other interesting things. So you, as you were talk, talking to me about your memory management strategy, I'm like, this is NASA. This is cool. Um, and uh, about the memory safety thing, you might also find this interesting. Like at least my coworkers at Kennedy Space Center, my team back there, I'm not there anymore, obviously, but like they tell me they don't adopt Rust for hmm. their satellite tracking software, for their uh, rocket uh, launch control software for the rockets like it's it's not rust and it's like hey wow. wouldn't, wouldn't you want rust to be there because it's memory safe and i'm like rust is not memory safe for our purposes and it's like wait what <laughs> and and that's that's the danger of blunt memes right that everybody just like says this is the slogan memory safety rust right and like, yeah. it just it just throws away context you know for for kennedy it's like well hold on like we care about the code gen what is and how how trivially can we uh review the code gen so you compile something and you have generated code and like that needs to be small trivial straightforward and it's going to live mm -hmm. on some satellite sensor tracking software for for decades in space and so we want a compiler that is tiny <laughs> we want a compiler mm -hmm. that we understand and we do not understand the rust compiler and <laughs> we cannot prove <laughs> we cannot prove that the code gen is is going to be safe and straightforward for us and we have like five levels of testing per project like when i added two lines of code billy to my mm -hmm. nasa I mean, when i was allowed to write code for nasa that was amazing i was still an intern at the beginning i wrote two lines of code and that went through five levels of verification with like uh, level one, my peers, level two, my manager, level three, the department director, and then like a QA department, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, the final chief signs off on it. It's like, when you are in this environment, like Rust and memories, like all of that's kind of like, doesn't make that much sense. Like the, the memory safety mm -hmm. meme there. Uh, so I thought you'd find that interesting. I'm not sure. I hope that was it. Yeah, no, that, that that's yeah. super interesting. Cause you would think like, oh, they would, they would care about it the, mo the yeah. most, but, and is there even that's, a spec for the Rust language? For Rust language? Uh, so I, I don't think there, there's even a language spec. I think it's just a compiler. So it, it's mm. just anyway. It's it's interesting. Like you know, when people tell yeah. me, yeah, use use Rust for to be memory safe at NASA. Like we know, like literal NASA engineers don't agree with you. So how yeah. about we avoid those dead slogans and memes? Right? Uh, it's my opinion. Now I hot take. I, it just like <laughs> the yeah memory management just wasn't. It really like wasn't that big of a deal. I was able to kind of reason about it yeah. pretty reliably, like as the project got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think it's overstated, at least in terms of yeah. games. It's not like it doesn't have its place, right? It's just yeah. I, I definitely have a visceral reaction to 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 blunt memes that like spread on fi like fire on Twitter, you know, like Rust and memory uh -huh. safety. It's just like please, like you need to be more grounded in yeah. reality. Exploit your context. That's a lot of handmade stuff. It's like know your context. You just talked have been talking about for the past hour about how very specific you were with your problem solving. Just like solving the situation at hand, knowing your context, knowing your environment. Like that's amazing. Like that's amazing. And like like gen generic branding memes to to like silver bullet like that doesn't help it just i don't mm -hmm. think we're, we're we're programmers here right? we're engineers hopefully you know um, yeah yeah and i think um only only like um only accepting complexity when it solves like a very specific problem i think it's just it's really important because overall the the problem I've faced with, you know, projects in the past, and I've seen other things that the thing that prevents you from shipping or finishing a project is like the slow accumulation of, of complexity or things you don't understand. So like, mm. I'm very reluctant to like, uh, add anything to the code that I don't like understand pretty deeply. Cause then like, it's like a crack in the foundation. Cause once you put it in there and then it is now going to be in the back of your head as like a potential failure case for the rest of the project. And that can be years and years and years. So, and those things will just, they don't go away. Um, and so you're always going to be wondering like, oh, maybe you're like, yeah, maybe if I'm using, I don't understand how the memory is allocated. Like maybe it's like out of memory or I don't know, or maybe there's like a circular reference or I'm just like <laughs> yeah. giving a very abstract example, for but sure. it's like, if you don't really understand how it works, like it can be doing you just don't know all the ways it could fail and you're going to be like really like sort of superstitious about like what might be happening. Um, and so 
yeah, I think another like benefit that, um, pe you know, people are often intimidated by like not using these off the shelf libraries and engines. Um, but it's kept, um, development like pretty predictable. And even, mm -hmm. you know, after almost seven years, um, going up to launch, I still, if I needed to make a dramatic change, it was like, um, a, it was a predictable amount of work because I knew how everything worked in the code base and I knew what needed to change. It might be like still like a good amount of work, but it wasn't, um, it was like predictable. It wasn't like, oh, this might take one day or it might take, or it might be literally impossible because the SDK doesn't support it. And we would need to put in a, a pull request to get <laughs> like it fixed or something. And they might not ever do it. And cause I've been, I've been at studios where we were like, you know, requesting features from unity or there's a bug in unity and, you know, you'd open a support ticket and be like, can you, can you fix this issue? And then, you know, nine months could go by. And then one engineer that maybe knew implemented that feature would be like, okay, it's on the roadmap. Um, <laughs> we'll let you know. And then until then you're literally just screwed. Like the problem is like unsolvable because of like the tech stack you've chosen to use. Um, I could have written like, you know, 20 renderers in that time from scratch, <laughs> like, and it would have been like horrible, but that's at least like predictable work. And, and um, yes. And before members of my audience who love Rust, uh, leave the chat and ask for a refund for, for the tickets. I'm, <laughs> I do like, I do like, uh, uh, the Rust. I, I do like what they're doing. They're solving a class of bugs. They really are. Right. It's just uh, there is a portion that we already know is in an infamous portion. I, I even think like uh, I joke around that, you know, years ago before Rust really took off, I had fights over things like Vim versus Emacs and, you know, interpreted languages like Python versus, you know, C and I, just like these, mm -hmm. these classical flame religious worlds, wars around editors, languages and things like that. Um, and I feel like that's almost dropped down to zero. I don't have those interactions anymore. It's like all, all the zealots in the programming industry have moved over under the Rust umbrella. And now oh. <laughs> it, just, it, it, it feels a little bit like that. So, you know, no hate, you know, uh, in gen overall. Yeah. And like I used software written by Rust, you know, rip grep. I love it. it, it it's like way better than grep and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, so anyway, uh, Billy, yeah, I'll, I'll also ahead. just make it clear. I have not used Rust at all. So don't, uh, yeah. Um, don't, I have no, no strong feelings about it. I, I write, yeah. write my code in C, C++ mostly just cause, uh, it's there and I have experience with it. And it's also just kind of part of my, uh, mm -hmm. philosophy for this project to like, not do any work unless it's like absolutely necessary. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's made sense for me to just like use the language I'm comfortable with. And yep. if I ran into a complete like roadblock or, or like, you know, is really the link, the language w w has not really gotten in the way of on my, my day-to-day -day programming tasks and problems. Yep. Um, it's not like super joyful to use, but it's not that bad to use. It's definitely not like the bottleneck. The bottleneck is like coming up with creative ideas and, uh, yep. mostly it's been design and art bottleneck. The, the engineering has been like pretty predictable. That's a good way of putting it. I love that. I, I, Billy, let's switch gears to sure. the, you, you didn't just write the tech stack. You also did game design. You also created art. You also even like voiced things like you, you there's, there's, <laughs> there, there are things beyond the programming that it sounds, you worked with a publisher to get your game off the ground and into the mainstream. You have, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a skill set here beyond just programming to be able to ship animal well. And I am so curious about this, intrigued even, because the Hammock community is full of talented, low-level programmers who uh, always, in the, if you go to their discords, like they, they have a showcase channel showing, hey, look at what I did. And like, look at that. And mm -hmm. it's like, you're like, whoa, like you're really, uh, the Hammond ethos is powerful. You can really, as an indie person, write software that can really eat uh, the lunch of, you know, corporate software. It really can. Yeah. Because like you said, you're, you're diving deep into how things work. You're not afraid of opening up your black boxes. You're not just stitching together magic functions and not understanding what's going on. No, you have like a complete understanding more and more. You're curious about how things work so you can innovate a lot more. That's awesome. But we have a never ship itis problem. <laughs> 
yeah. never ship items. Like it's hard for us to ship. It really is. It, 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 one of the reasons I brought you to the conference uh, today, and I'm grateful that you're here, is talk to us a little bit about. Tell me about animal well beyond just the programming what, whatever you are feel comfortable sharing with us the, the mm -hmm. skills that you needed to make, maybe develop to to get it out out, out the door and maybe there were things that, that you're not comfortable doing that you had to do you know like many programmers mm -hmm. in the community you know we're not necessarily particularly social people i'm a bit of, a, of an exception i'm a social butterfly uh, but most programmers and i understand um just don't want to do a lot of people stuff right but i would imagine that you also have to do people stuff and uh i just don't know tell me t <laughs> tell me yeah, how you yeah, got yeah. animal was shipped because that's that's quite an accomplishment yeah so um i think yeah i'm like a, a kind of a programmer first and foremost but um that being said i i didn't i discovered programming pretty late in life like you know i didn't have any one in my life that was also a programmer growing up um I had, you know, computers as a kid, but I didn't, I just used them like from a very sort of, uh, sort of basic consumer kind of level. <laughs> um, and, uh, didn't just, you know, was, was interested in them and they were kind of like, you know, very, um, again, magical to me, but I didn't really know how they worked. Um, so early on, I was, uh, very much into like just drawing, drawing uh in school and um in high school i got into like film filmmaking um so uh and i was interested in like how video worked and stuff there's a lot of like overlap between you know computing and uh sort of video production and um they're both like pretty you know there's a lot of technology involved either way um and yeah and i first got into i guess deeper into computers when I, I did start building gaming PCs in high school. Um, when I, cause I wanted to play half-life two, it all started because, um, I played the original half-life when it came out I was in like fifth grade, I think. Um, and it happened to run. Okay. on my parents like beige, uh, chunky, like a uh, PC they had at the time, coincidentally it, it worked. Um, so I was a fan of that game, but then wasn't ever really into PC games that much, but then Half-Life 2 came out, what is this, 2014 or whatever. Um, and I was like, okay, I should, I should play this. I don't know anything really about PC games, but I want to play this. So I bought it and I tried to install it on my like family's computer at the time. And it, you know, ran it like five frames a second. <laughs> it's just like, uh, so that I think start open the whole like can of worms where I was like, why, why doesn't this work? Or like, what, what is wrong about our computer that is preventing this? And then at that time I realized like, okay, you can get a graphics card and, um, I mean, I'll, I'll let's get one of these and, you know, I'll try to fix, you know, got like a basic, uh, like Radeon graphics card from Best Buy for like $200. And like getting that is like, okay. And the game like ran all right. It ran at like, you know, 30 frames a second or something. It was like playable, but it was still like pretty stuttery. Um, and I don't think I could pick like the highest graphics options um, or the, maybe the highest texture resolution. Then I was like, oh, kind of had to learn what RAM was. Um, and then if, I, if like the computer we had could like, um, if it was even upgradable. And so I was like very rapidly kind of learning how a PC is put together. And then I eventually got like a better graphics card after that and realized like, oh, the power supply is probably not big enough to support the draw of this. I like upgraded to a GTX uh, or 7800 GT, I think it was at the time, which was pretty, pretty good. That was like when I was like more um, further along. Um, and, but it, it took, it was like a, for a few years, I was like Half-Life 2 was this like benchmark I had of like, how well can I run, run this game? And I kept like doing all these incremental upgrades to the PC and then eventually just like decided I would just like build my own, I like learned enough at the time, um, went and, you know, bought all the parts and that was like a whole journey. This was probably when I was like 16 years old. Um, and uh yeah just got really into like pc games and um sort of uh you know 
fine tuning, being like a Windows power user um, <laughs> in like kind of a kind of a superficial sense where I was like, you know, installing like mods for games or doing like registry tweaks to like try to improve performance or, um, you know, uninstalling like bloatware on people's computers. So I, I remember feeling like, oh, I know a lot about computers, but I couldn't even tell you, I, I couldn't even name like more than one or two programming languages. I had zero programming mm. ability at all. Mm. Um, and so I had this kind of superficial consumer like point of view of um, how computers worked. Um, and that was the case until I think like later in college when uh, I sort of had some friends that were programming and I was kind of like, I kind of had a part of as part of my identity that I was like, a, you know, a, a, a computer like power user and I knew how things work. But then I was like, kind of a wake up call that it's like, okay, I don't actually know how a software is made at all. Um, and I'm actually kind of embarrassed. Uh, and then yeah, so I, I started a program and um, yeah, just eventually kind of I, I started with processing. That was the first programming language I learned, which was like geared towards artists, and uh, and then kind of just coincidentally learned C plus plus pretty early on. And then it was, it was like when you don't really know what you don't know, I was, you just take like a you cast a really wide net. So I remember I got like a book on Linux. I got a book on uh, SQL. Uh, I had a book on JavaScript and C plus plus, and I was like trying to just like learn all that simultaneously and um i don't know it's kind of funny uh, looking back of like i don't use most of that knowledge <laughs> like colorful at all choices. aside from c plus yes. plus and <laughs> maybe a little bit of linux <laughs> in certain situations um but i just didn't know what what i wanted to be um yeah so so yeah but it was at that point where um i was finally i don't know well, throughout my life i was just slowly developing all the these like, like a scatter shot of skills. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was like in the, in film school at the time for college. And, uh, I don't know, just like, wasn't super excited about it. I was in the beginning, but slowly kind of felt a little disenfranchised. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, just wasn't, I feel like my heart wasn't in it. <clears throat> um, but then it, it took, a while until I sort of stumbled into the idea that you could program a video game um, while I was just like learning to program throughout this whole like journey as like video games were kind of always a part of my life. I was exploring all these different hobbies. Um, but since I was like three years old, I've been playing like, you know, NES games and they, they were just like, uh, like a constant uh, through line. Um, all this like sort of meandering I was doing. Uh, but, um, so yeah, I guess all of that is to say that, um, I guess going into animal well development, I had the programming ability because I, that's like what I ended up doing after graduating and had multiple jobs learning those, developing that skill. But in the back of my head, I did still have some like art skills that were like maybe a little rusty. Um, and. Also, I have dabbled around with music uh, since I was a kid as well on like kind of crappy um, like Casio keyboards and stuff uh, and like took a, a little bit of piano lessons. I was, I'm very, it's very basic, but um, it's something I'm like had a passing familiarity with. Um, but yeah, so the, the point is like to for all these, so you asked about what what skills are necessary other than engineering to like ship a, a game? Um, and I feel like I kind of got sidetracked, but that's, no, 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 it's, it's good to know your background. It's, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's like a lot of things and, and even what I described is not even everything. Cause people, I think the classic breakdown is like, oh, you need the programmer, the artist, the designer, and the, um, composer or something. And they're like the four uh like roles that are used to finish a game but even that that's like half of the skills <laughs> you truly need um because uh 
getting something published, getting something like localized, learning how to like play test things, um, like reading through documentation and talking to the platforms and um, learning how to market a game and going to shows and talking to people and, and learning how to interview, um, give interviews. Like these are all additional skills that I would say are necessary to like ship and market. Um, Was it overwhelming for you at first? Um, yeah. So for a long time, I would say the first four years, I was just kind of working by myself. Um, and I can, you know, kept the scope of the game really low with, um, in terms of art and music. Cause I was like a little less confident in those, but those skills were sort of naturally built during development. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was just like, I was doing the like lone wolf sort of programmer thing where I was just working on it alone and not involving other people. And that was like kind of low stress for me because I think as soon as I have to involve another person into like the creative process, then, then I start worrying about like, okay, well, how do I give them feedback if they do something I don't like? I don't want to like hurt their feelings. I don't want to, uh, what if I need to ask them for help or I'm dependent on them Then I'm going to have to wait and then how do I reach out with them? And then it adds, it just adds all this sort of social complexity. Um, and if you're really, if you really, really care about something and, uh, you get really invested in it, like how I kind of was at animal well, it's like that becomes harder. Like if I, if you're on a team and it's like a, like at the other studios I've worked with, I worked with a lot of other programmers, but like, you kind of have to, I guess, lower your um, emotional investment a little bit just so to oh. allow wiggle room for collaboration. Um, so you got to kind of like be less tied to like one particular vision and you have to trust that other people will, will um, you know, do their job. So you couldn't treat so, it like you're, you were like, this, I'm being overprotective with my baby. Like this, this game is my baby. I'm being overprotective. You're saying you can't be overprotective. You have to open up to collaboration. You, you can't be a lone wolf kind of situation. Yeah. 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 Kind of. Um, so, so in the past, I kind of like knew, knew that like you, you just, you have to be open to collaboration and you have to be like polite with people and you have to like act in such a way where other people like maintain their motivation and they don't like <laughs> think you're a total asshole and uh want to quit quit the project um so but but animal well kind of was in a spot where it like was my baby because i was just not no one else really knew about it and all the design decisions were kind of just iterated on internally in my head and never never vocalized um and in a way it was like kind of intended to be that project where it was just like, this is my escape from everything else where I can just do things exactly how I want That's fair. to do them. Um, but, but yeah, so even still there's like, there was a lot of skills I didn't like have to finish the project. Like, uh, I was, I had almost no clue on like how to how to market the game because you invest all this time in it and ultimately you want people to play it and you want it to be known about in the world. Um, and so about four years in, I reached out to my, my business partner, Dan Edelman, who's uh, a very important character in, <laughs> in the game's <laughs> sort of story. Um, and he was uh, kind of a little bit famous for um, helping start the indie games business at both, um, Xbox and Nintendo. So, so he was, he's like very in tune with like indie games. Um, and, um, you know, worked with the developers of like Shovel Knight and World of Goo and, uh, um, kind of all these sort of, sort of seminal games. Um, and then he went independent after about nine or 10 years of being at Nintendo and, uh, decided to sort of just be a hired gun for indie developers that were like small, either one person or small teams. Um, and he worked on, uh, Axiom Verge, if anyone's heard of that, um, that's made oh, by yeah. a solo developer named Tom Hap. Um, so Dan worked with him to help Tom, uh, do all the, all the out external facing work just so he could focus on the development and, um, and then 
just have someone else that would be like their public champion and, and apply for, you know, showcases and, Amazing. um, talk to platforms and, um, you know, schedule meetings and just, you know, send all the emails that like are not fun to send. Uh, so <laughs> it sounds like, uh, the part where you might want somebody to be your public <laughs> champion and to do the kind of mm -hmm. work that's necessary to ship a game that you may not be that into, you know, it could be like, like you said, sending dozens of emails to different kinds of business people or, uh, mm -hmm. having a strong presence online in ways that you're not comfortable, like putting yourself out there. So like you had like a, you wanted a public champion. So you, you did your best to find one and you found one in your business partner. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because other than that, I, my, my marketing plan was like trying to post on Twitter, um, <laughs> like once every two months or something. And I'm just not a very like online, uh, social person. So it was always kind of stressful to do that and try to make a, a GIF for the game and, and show it off. And then I'd be like very anxious about like, are were people, are people liking the thing I posted? And, um, oftentimes like in the early days think something would get like four likes or something <laughs> and then it would, you know, it actually like hurt my motivation, uh, rather than help it. Um, because I just didn't have a big following. And to be honest, the early, the early days of animal well, were it was looking much more primitive. Um, it was like less, it was a less interesting project because that just sort of, it became that slowly over time. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I reached out to Dan and luckily enough, he liked the game enough to, you know, maybe want to work on it with me. Um, and he saw the potential in it. Like the game didn't look as good back then, but the controls at least felt good. And I knew he, uh, liked pixel art Metroidvania games cause he had worked with other developers making those kind of games. Mm -hmm. So I picked him because he had this skill set that I wanted and I thought he would, he kind of had a soft spot for the genre or the style of game I was making. So he'd be able to like better extrapolate, um, like where the project was going. Um, he could see it in an earlier state than other people and see the potential in it. Um, so, wow. so that was, I, I think my, my reasoning for, for reaching out to him. Um, but. But once that happened, I, that sort of helped me kind of bootstrap the whole like kind of marketing process by getting help in this, like the business and marketing sort of side of things. Um, I like just wouldn't have to worry about it as much in the future. Um, or at least that was my thought. I would be like, okay, I just, I have to be brave and reach out to this one person and send this like kind of email that may get ignored. Um, and it's just not fun. I don't want to do it, but if I can convince them to work with me, then, then they'll do all that in the future. And I can go back to my corner that's, and just, that's interesting. Program. That's interesting. Cause you did say you are a programmer at heart and you're working on, you're working on your, your baby, you're working on your project and you're like, but it sounds like mm -hmm. you do acknowledge because, uh, help, help me here. I, I think it's true. I think that programmers, uh, and I, again, I understand like they have, especially in our community, typically an aversion to the world of business and an aversion to the mm -hmm. world of just, again, just like the social dimension of things. Cause it's like, yeah. there's, there's plenty of, uh, what do you call it? Snake oil people. And like, there's, there's deceivers and yeah. there's, there's corruption. And like, there's just like awful things over there and you like, don't want to, don't want to touch it. And my counter argument, <laughs> cause I am social is that, Hey, mm -hmm. You know, in the tech side, we have snake oil people too. I mean, we have clean code principles and we have, uh, we have uncle Bob, sorry, uncle Bob, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Andy and I'm calling you out. I don't think your clean code principles were uh, a net positive for, for the tech industry. Um, so, so, so we have, uh, in the programming side, right. That the same kind of people or like behaviors that we don't agree with. So I'm just trying to mm -hmm. say that the shit is, is, is uh, spread everywhere. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, for sure. And I think ultimately, so my plan was to like, let Dan do, do all this work, but, but what ended up happening was I actually, I learned a lot from him on terms of the business and marketing side and actually found it more interesting than I would have guessed. Um, just, uh, kind of just seeing the process of how, you know, the platforms like work with indie developers and how they get pitches and, 
Um, and how do you how do you book a booth space at PAX? And mm -hmm. um, there's just lots of logistics. How do you who do you reach out to get a game localized? Um, it's genuine work. It's hard work often. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a lot of work, and I kind of gained an appreciation for it. Um, and and I would say in terms of like sort of this like handmade ethos. Um, if you want to make everything yourself or, or understand the process, like top to bottom, uh, a lot of those parts aren't programming. And, um, a lot of them are more on like sort of the business end of things and, and all that stuff is interesting and complicated and sort of in analyzing the market, um, that you're going to go into learning how how many wish lists you should expect a game to have and how that correlates to sales and um, how, how can you sort of project the finances. And it's, it's a lot of interesting things are like where, what, what shows are worth applying to um, in terms of like marketing value and mm -hmm. what like wish lists you can expect and which ones aren't. And uh, like what what's the yearly schedule for all these all these things and um you end up meeting a lot of cool people that are going to like the the shows on an annual basis and it's just a it's a whole yeah it's a whole thing uh, and it, it's actually pretty fun a, a good friend um, of the community uh, dr dimitris panos uh gives a good analogy about the business world it's very much like playing poker often because you you may not know exactly if you're gonna hit the market with like uh you know, Animal World is going to do super well. Like nobody can truly mm -hmm. accurately 100% guarantee your success, but you can play poker a little bit. You're like, you know, like I'm reading, I'm like you said, I'm doing some market analysis. <laughs> I'm looking at the shows that are available, things that we can apply to. I'm looking at social media. I'm looking at the trends, the zeitgeist, the timing, and like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, you can have a nose for it and sort of like uh, place your bets and some bets. Uh, if you if you you can become competent in in business, some bets are better than others, and it sounds like yeah, your business yeah, partner was sure. able to make better bets than uh, most other people, and like that's helpful and it's a skill, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's a there's a really a, like a lot of strategy to it, and it's not okay. you know uh, there's just a lot of people out there like saying mm -hmm. um, that marketing a game is kind of just like blind luck and it's all randomness, and you can kind of you can be There's just some randomness. Only about some, it. though, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, there is some randomness, but like I think your poker net analogy is pretty good. Um, it's like any you don't know w which event you're going to go to that's going to like make a big difference because it there is so much randomness involved. But you can kind of increase the odds by just like doing a lot of different things. You just have to assume like anything I do might have a ten percent chance of being very meaningful and like opening up a big opportunity. Um, and that's like, those are maybe pretty bad odds, but you can just keep trying a lot of different things and, uh, just sort of see what sticks and overall, like comfortable probability that like some good things will happen. Um, and then a big part of that is, you know, making a good game. And then, um, yeah, the other part is like, yeah. just really putting a lot of work into like showing that game to people and, yeah. and being receptive to feedback and um, yeah. being honest about like where the flaws are and what work needs to be done and and what your competition is and um, knowing what people are going to expect and then making sure you're like providing an experience that's worth their time and is like uh, worth their money um, and can can honestly like compete with what what other things they would want to so do with their time. If I could give a summary, by the way, when you gave us your background on how you got to where you are, I really do appreciate it because you it sounds like you are kind of like the typical everyday man, jack of all trades kind of kind of person. And then that demystifies you a little bit, right? Because <laughs> you have mm -hmm. you have the community really admiring you for what you've done. And then we might create create a legend around you where we feel we can't ever <laughs> achieve achieve what you've achieved. And so with you giving yeah. us your background, it sounds like oh, okay. You know he's he's human, right? He he's human, oh. and, and I can do I can do the same. Um, and it also sounds like again I'm trying to summarize what you said because I, I really want this advice to be helpful for other handmade people. It you would mm -hmm. recommend make the good game first. You know, make your make your project, yeah, make yes. your product. That's that's obviously the the core of everything. Is you're gonna have you're gonna build something that you are proud of, but then you acknowledge that there is a world out there of 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 of, of 
of socializing, of business, of sales, of uh, putting things on the mainstream that, that requires skills too. And mm -hmm. you can't just say, oh, it's all bad. You know, like, I hate that. And it's like, no, 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 it, 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 it's, it's, there's some randomness to it. There are snake oil salesmen over there, but you know, it's same over here, really. And it's just like, but there are some good people out there and there's a strategy to this and there are ways to make this work. So either you decide to learn some business acumen or you decide, I think like, it sounds like you decided, yeah, that's not, I'm not, I don't really like that. I don't like that too much. I, I don't want to be like day to day mm -hmm. doing businessy stuff. I want to work on my projects. So who do I trust? It sounds like, right? Who do, who yeah. do I trust to work on the other dimension of things that are required to ship this game and succeed? Right. I, I, am I summarizing it fairly accurately? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's valid. And, and I, I will say, I think if you don't do the business and marketing part of it, if you don't invest the time or money into that, I, I would guess your chances of success are very, very, very low. It's like trying, you can like, um, plan the best party or whatever possible at your house and like, you know, cater all this food and get the big bouncy, bouncy thing on your front lawn. And, uh, you know, just, you know, decorate really well. But then if you don't like send out invitations, like literally <laughs> it's going to be a complete failure and no one will come. Um, so it's kind of like that where it's like, you can make an incredible game, but then if you just don't tell anybody about it and, and when I say tell people about it, that involves like a, a lot of work and, and like a very strategic and thoughtful, like marketing campaign that just is very time consuming to put together. But, uh, like people just won't know. There's so many things competing for people's attention in the world nowadays. And, um, yeah, you just, you won't get lucky. Like maybe you, you'll I mean, hope there are some, like, sometimes small, people like, pray. Yeah. Like I'll go viral on Twitter, hopefully and you're praying, but that's a, that's not a solid strategy. It sounds, it sounds like you're just no, Yeah. Hail Mary like, almost. Yeah. Right. You should, you should come up with a solid strategy. Like you wouldn't do that in terms of like, getting your game to work like you're putting a lot of solid work into programming and making like assets for it um i think you should you should That's be like thorough and deliberate about figuring out all the ways you can minimize risk in terms of like your marketing plan as well um so there are there's just a lot of there's more things in people's control than they realize like there are um you know there's a whole bunch of shows that happen on an annual basis and you can apply to them like and there's a very decent chance you'll get accepted um to them and uh even if it's like a 25 percent chance you'll get accepted like okay then just apply to four of them and then on average that's better like, than the one yeah. percent of going viral on twitter or something right like yeah yeah, yeah. exactly and then okay. um getting into something like day of the devs which happens uh multiple times a year but specifically the summer one during summer games fest um when Animal Well was shown in there, we got like like twenty thousand wish lists from being in that live stream where millions of people were watching. Amazing. Um, and and I think like I, I should I would encourage it's kind of like a, a, a secret, but people shouldn't apply to that for sure. Um, Love it. It's just like you don't. I learned so much about where the opportunities were and um, that I didn't know before. There, there are a lot of opportunities, but it, it is a skill to like research them and learn, um, and learn what they are. I have to mention, because this is a handmade conference, there is Handmade Seattle. So right now, people watching this, this is Handmade mm -hmm. Boston. This, Like I said, this is like our, our smaller conference right now. It's more intimate. We're just having conversations with people we admire. Uh, so it's a sister conference. But the Handmade Seattle conference, that's the biggest show for the handmade community. We have trade shows, we have job fair, we have demos, we have talks, we have fireside chats. It's like the largest celebration uh, for indie, you know, uh, indie conferences for, for low level programmers. And uh, there's one example of a project from last year in 2023 of a project called Disc Voyager. And Disc Voyager is not a video game, <laughs> but it is a handmade project. It is a file explorer. And uh, I hope you guys can check it out, diskvoyager.com. Voyage, it's, it's a file explorer. It just wants to replace the file explorer on Windows. And I asked him, hey, I want you to be at the conference. Please make a demo. Please make a little video and answer questions, uh, do a Q&A with people. And he made, like, he made a solid five-minute video. It's still on the landing page of the website where it's like, whoa, 
he's just showing the file explorer struggling to open up a, a few hundred thousand files to sort. Uh, <laughs> and, and then he does it in like half a second or less, right? Or like or millions of files sorted like right away, right? And batch renaming, which got huge applause uh, uh, on, <laughs> on the audience and like other, it's just buttery smooth, it's snappy. Um, it's a wonderful, it's, the, the EXE is tiny, it's tiny. I use it every day now, I have, I have access to the alpha, hey, hey. And he told me he only had about 100 signups, 100 signups for his uh, newsletter. And then after him at Seattle, that shot up to 5,000. And then uh, these days he has like 10,000, right? So I'm not saying him at Seattle, it's the only thing that gave him success so far, obviously not. But it was a platform that he used to great advantage and I, I would love it if people in the audience watching now, Henry Seattle's coming up again. It's going to be the 10 year anniversary. I invited Billy. I hope he's going to, I hope he's our guest of honor if, if that's possible. You know, no hard feelings if you can't, but hopefully we're talking, see if it's possible to have him fly over in person. Um, so just come, like if you have a demo, if you have a talk, if you have a presentation, like talk to me, go to the website that you see on the screen right now, hemisadies.com slash Seattle instead of Boston. And, you know, like, like Billy is saying, basically, this is the advice, you know, like, look at the events out there, look at the shows out there and take a risk. And if you feel scared about the business side of things, find somebody that you trust, say some friend that you think is like social, maybe some, uh, maybe reach out to some business partner who's like, that you think is like out of your league, but maybe they like your project, right, Billy? Like maybe. Yeah, like, exactly. You never know. Um, okay. Cool. Uh, Billy, do you have any, since I have uh, really taken a lot of your time, uh, thank you so much. No, no. This has been yeah, it's totally fine. amazing. Uh, um, I think this, this interview really uh, went deep into technical things that you haven't been, had the chance to do in other interviews. So I hope you had fun. And any last minute kind of like uh, comments or conversation or like advice, right, to people making handmade projects and like um, what they should be thinking about. Any kind of like last minute advice or thoughts? Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, don't be afraid to, you know, just put the work in. Like, I think just to have faith in yourself that, um, if you are really dedicated and you're going to put years and years of work into a project, like it's inevitable that you're going to do something special that people care about. I, I, I really think that like, um, uh, like like eventually like other people I think will, will notice. Cause like you're kind of reversing entropy in a way and you're creating something like they're, they're like almost has to be valued there. <laughs> like if you are motivated enough to stick with it uh, and you care about it, I think that will, whether you understand exactly what you're doing or not, like eventually I think something will kind of crystallize and, and you'll have something that gives you leverage and um, people want. Uh, and it might be a really weird thing, but but it'll be yours, and it'll be <laughs> there for you to to try to leverage. Um, and and then if, if if you're not there yet, then you know I think it might just it might just take a really long time. Um, but then but then yeah, when you have to tell other people about it and 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 market it, that that is almost just like view that as continuous with the rest of the work involved it's it's still it's it's a fundamental problem you have to solve and uh it's not any different than developing the thing itself and um i think you should treat it with the same seriousness that uh you treated the other aspects of the project billy um, we want to see you in person drink chocolate vine with me please <laughs> Please say yes. Please say yes. Uh, no, I would love to. I have to. I have to look at the calendar. It's been. It's a very busy year. But especially I, for you. I mean, yeah, you. But but hopefully, uh, and if not in the future, I will have you drink chocolate vine with me. Go, gotta yes, do a toast. Yes. Gotta do a toast. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this handmade Boston exclusive presentation, and we will see Billy again in the handmade community sometime, someplace, hopefully in Seattle. Yes. Otherwise, there's plenty of chances. Well, you know, I'm here to stay. The community is here to stay. So, Billy, thanks again. See you around. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Amazing.